to post. But let me introduce you in broad terms to Professor Scholes. Um, he's a professor of systems ecology at the University of Witwatersrand. He's a systems ecologist with a particular interest in the savannas of Africa. He trained under Professor Brian Walker at the university and Professor Pedro Sanchez at North Carolina State University and has a, over three decades of field experience in many parts of Africa and the world. He's among the top 1% of environmental scientists worldwide based on citation frequency being acknowledged by all other scientists, publishing widely in the fields of savanna ecology, global change, and earth um, observation. He has led several high-profile studies, like the assessment of ele elephant management, commission, the Commission on Sustainable Agricultural and Climate Change, strategic assessment of shale gas, Development. The whole scale of things in the Karoo was he the layer of the research there. And large research campaigns. Safari 2000, a South African Millennium Assessment. Um, he's doing um, work in assessment. That is the main thing he's, 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 busy, he's doing at the moment. And a leader in assessment, assessments and assessment theory. He is or has been a member of the steering committee of several international council of scientific unions research programs. Bob was an author of the intergovernmental uh, panel on climate change, third, fourth, and fifth assessments, and was co-chair of the conditions working group of the Millennium Ecosystem. That's a global um, exercise. The panel on climate change, third, fourth. Um, he was an author of this intergovernmental panel. Um, he's co-chair of the Intergovernmental Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services Assessment of Land Degradation. He has been a member of the steering committees of several global earth observation bodies, global climate observ observing syst system, global terrestrial observing system, he was the chair of that group on earth observation, implementation planning task team, Geobiodiversity Observation Network, he was the chair of that, he has been on the boards of the International Center for Research in Agroforestry, the South African National Parks and South African National Space Agency. You will realize when I read this that he's a global leader in ev environmental matters. Friends, and you know that this, this is most probably the most important topic of our time. So we have a very, <laughs> very esteemed speaker today. Um, he's a foreign associate of the, US the United States National Academy of Sciences, fellow of the CSIR, fellow of the Royal Society of South Africa, member of the South African Academy, research associate of the CSIR, and an and, and NRFA rated science scientist, and a winner of the National Science and Technology Forum Lifetime Contribution to Science Award. How does that sound, huh? Yeah. In uh, January 2015, he took up his distinguished professorship at WITS in the Global Change and Sustainability Research Institute, School of, School of Animal, Plant and Environmental Sciences. Friends, it's a huge honor to have him with us. We welcome you, Professor Scholes, and we can't wait to hear you speak. Thank you, Nelson. Thank you for the eight nuachen. It really is a huge <laughs> privilege and pleasure uh, to, to speak to you today. And I do apologize that I will be speaking English. I can understand Afrikaans very well, but I can't both speak it and listen to technical questions. So uh, rather, let's just keep this, keep this simple. Um, so when I was thinking uh, about how I was after my, the invitation, 
I, I was thinking, now how am I going to present this subject to a community such as this? And I was actually sitting in church uh, a few Sundays ago, uh, it was Easter Sunday, and I had this revelation that I shouldn't approach it through the lens of ecological sin, but through the lens of the possibility of ecological redemption. So I will um, start off telling you some, some really bad news, actually. There's no way of making this a, a, a comfortable story. Uh, and we will go through the scientific understanding of what's happening uh, in the world at the present time. We will then uh, look at what are the impacts of that within Southern Africa. So what are the potential consequences in Southern Africa? And then I would like to spend a significant amount of time talking about what we can do about it. So there is something which the science community has had to learn the hard way, and we should have in fact learned it from the Christian community, which is that you can't motivate uh, long-term sustained human behavior change on the basis of fear. So you can give everyone a groot skruk once, okay? Two times, doesn't work. All right, and so this whole story of we're all gonna die, uh, it's all gonna be terrible, you know, people listen to you and then they go on and carry on with their, with their lives. In order to motivate people to actually make a difference, there has to be hope. And so I'm going to try to show some of the things that give us hope and what we can individually and collectively do to create a future which is livable for our children. So if I can have the, 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 the slides up, just to remind me where I'm going. So it won't have escaped your notice, especially those of you who've lived through the recent droughts, that there's a whole bunch of stuff going on in the world climate system. I don't, in fact, in South Africa, very frequently encounter people who deny climate change because they've seen it, you know, they've, they've lived through it. Uh, we've experienced in the last 10 years, or well, in the last 20 years, the 10 hottest years, not just in the climate record, which goes back here in South Africa to about 1850, but in human experience. We are able to push back the climate record using what we call proxy records, tree rings, uh, records of ice accumulation and things like that. We can push that back for about four million years. Humans and human ancestors have never experienced a hotter world than the one we're currently in. And there's all kinds of evidence of ice caps melting, glaciers melting, sea ice disappearing. The, we have measures of the heat content of the deep oceans. All of these things are going up. And in South Africa, we've seen just in the last decade completely unprecedented changes in climate-related phenomenon. You know, things like huge fires. The Neisner fire is a good example, one amongst many. Massive droughts, floods, heat waves, high winds. Those are things which haven't been as common in our history, in our recorded history, as they presently are. So something's going on. Next slide, please. Well, let's take a big step back and say, in fact, we live in a, on, a, on a very, very special planet. It is possible that out in the immensity of the universe that there may be other planets that could support life, but up until now, we've never discovered one. As far as we know, this is the only place in this entire universe that, that life can exist and, that, and that, that we can exist. And the reason for that is a very special set of circumstances. You remember the story of Goldilocks who walked into the, the, the house and there were the, you know, the, the bowls of porridge and this one was too hot and that one was cold, too cold and the one in the middle was just right. Well, that's true for Earth. We have planets slightly closer to the, to the sun, Venus. It's 400 degrees Celsius there. You can't live at 400 degrees Celsius. It's not because it's slightly closer to the sun, it's because it doesn't have our atmosphere. It in fact has an atmosphere of carbon dioxide which traps all the heat and so lead will melt on the surface of, of, of Venus. You can't live there. On the other hand, you can go out if you like with Elon Musk and you can you know, settle on Mars. It's not a lacquer place, okay? It's minus 55 degrees. That means any water is frozen. Life under that circumstance 
is no good either. So we live in this just perfect little zone, and our the perfection of that zone is maintained by this thin layer of atmosphere we have around the world, which just keeps things perfect for human life and for all other kinds of life. Next slide, please. But what we've noticed in the last 150-odd um, years is that the global temperature has been rising. Not smoothly, it rises giggledy-jiggledy, because that's the nature of the, 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 the Earth system, but absolutely it has been increasing. And we know that that is not due to, for instance, just some big solar cycle or a wobble in our, at, in, our, in our orbit or the effect of volcanoes. We understand all that stuff, and you can't read it, but all those diagrams on the right are looking backwards in time the top one looking backwards 50 million years, the next one looking back 4 million years, the next one looking back 100,000 years, which is the period of human civilization. Human civilization really only started 100,000 years ago, and it came about in a period of remarkable climate stability, which we call the Holocene. That has made possible everything that we believe in as humans, not our existence. Our existence predated that. But what we believe in, a civilization which cares, uh, a civilization which has art and literature and science, those things came about in the last 10,000 years because of the climate stability that we've been in. And we are now, in the last 150 years, leaving that phase of climate stability into an unknown territory where humans have never been before. Okay. hear that? I can't hear that. Is it switched on? Hello? Is that good? Can we switch this one off? Is that already off? I don't want to have a screaming. All right, good. All right, so we, we cannot explain this change in the Earth's climate in any of the ways that you would automatically think, well, you know, it might be this, it might be that. We've eliminated all that. The only explanation which actually matches the pattern that we see, next slide, is these tiny changes in the composition of the Earth's atmosphere. And you say, how can a, a concentration of a gas which only makes up 0.04% of the atmosphere, that's carbon dioxide, 0.04% percent of the atmosphere. How can that affect the world in this way? Well, it can, because in fact, previously, it was at 0.02 percent. We have doubled the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and a number of other gases. And we understand the physics of how that leads the Earth to then retain more of the solar energy that comes in and let more out. Okay, and that's what's causing the temperature of the world to rise. So because more energy is coming in than is going out. It's a simple balance. It will go up until a new equilibrium is, is, is struck. Next slide, please. So here's a quick summary of some of the yes, but kind of questions that you will often hear standing around the bry place or, or whatever. So at the one extreme, you still get people who say, this is all fake news, you know, as a certain president of a major country whose name I will not mention. The only way to deal with narcissists is to ignore them, okay? Anyway, there is a vast amount of data that absolutely substantiates climate change. Within the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, we have a very measured set of language that we use. So we will say something is highly likely or near certain, and we, there's a precise meaning for those things. We don't have a word for this. We had to create a new word. It's unequivocal. There is no scientific doubt that the climate of the world is changing. The second part is, ah, yeah, yeah, it's changing, but, you know, it's a natural cycle. If you go back into the climate history of the world, it's been all over the show. There's the Pleistocene, interpleistocene. Absolutely, scientifically well established. This isn't one of those. Okay, those cycles exist. This isn't one. Then they say, well, well you know, the scientists don't agree. When the scientists agree, uh, you know, then we'll take action. Actually, 99% of the scientists who have a basis 
for making statements about this issue, okay, agree what's going on. There's very, very little dissension. The dissension that you will sometimes hear from people who style themselves as scientists, they might be a scientist in a completely unrelated field, okay, but they are making pronouncements about this. But in fact, there's very, very little of that. The next sort of thing you get is, well, you know, okay, so the climate's changing. Why do I care? So what? Well, I will show you in the next few slides that the impacts of this are extremely material. They directly threaten human well-being, um, and they threaten the well-being of the, all the other organisms with which on, we share this planet. The next sort of position is, well, okay, so it's bad and it's happening, but there's nothing we can do about it, so why don't we just you know, go and have a party? The answer to that is, they are, we are committed to an uncomfortable degree of climate change. There's nothing we can do about that. But if we want to avoid an unsurvivable level of climate change, we are still have space to do that. Okay, so there are things we can do. It won't keep us completely from you know, get, getting, uh, getting burned, uh, but it will protect future generations and put them in a position where they have a viable future. Then there's an argument, particularly from places like South Africa, that said that the developed world did this. Okay, they, they caused this, they must fix it. From a pure equity point of view, that's true, uh, but it doesn't help. You know, the analogy I give is we're all sitting in this lifeboat, and the lifeboat is sinking. You know, now is not the time to say, no, no, you guys you know, must, must, must do the rowing and the bailing. We're just passengers here. You know, we all, in fact, have to do this if we are going to make this work. It has to be a global, collective response, and that's what makes it politically so difficult. And then the final argument is, yeah, yeah, okay, it's important, but it's not urgent. We've got to deal with corruption, we've got to deal with, you know, this and that and the other, we'll get to that. And the problem with that is that although climate change is a slowly evolving phenomenon, it has an enormous inherent time lag in it. So in other words, unless you started addressing it already two decades ago, as you know, Nielus has, has, has pointed out, you actually end up in a place where your options are extremely limited. So it is in fact urgent, it's just that we don't perceive it to be urgent. Okay, we perceive it as something in the future, therefore we can deal with other things and get around to them time. But by the time we get there, by the time we get to the crisis mode, we no longer have any options left. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so let's sort of paint the big picture uh, around climate change in, in southern Africa. The first is that although the world as a whole, a warmer world is a wetter world, we know that from you know, fossil records, all sorts of things. That's not true for Southern Africa. It's just one of those unfair things, you know, that in fact a warmer world in Southern Africa is generally a drier world, and that's especially true in the Western Cape and the interior of, of, of South Africa. Secondly, we can anticipate that the intensity of storms goes up essentially everywhere. The way I explain this is we're putting the world's climate system onto steroids. You know, we're pumping it up, we're putting more energy into it. So everything that happens, happens with greater intensity. Both on the flood side, we get bigger floods, but also on the drought side, we get uh, bigger droughts. We can anticipate with absolute certainty increases in temperature everywhere in southern Africa. We increase temperature more in the interior of the country than on the coast. The coast is kept cool by the oceans around it. So that will also warm up, but the interior warms up at twice uh, that rate. And that means for places like the Northern Cape and the Karoo, which are already uncomfortably hot, it pushes us over the edge where it becomes intolerably hot. And we will also at the same time see sea level rise everywhere. Now South Africa is fortunate to having a relatively steep coast. So the whole country doesn't get flooded, but there are certain places around the edge of the country that do, and many of our neighboring countries actually have a real sea level rise problem. Just as a little reminder, you know, the big cyclone which hit um, Byra uh, a, a month ago, the effective sea level rise of that was about 11 meters. 
So there's a baseline increase, then you get something called a storm surge when they have a big cyclone and then it pulls all the water together in a big bulge in the open, cause a storm, and on top of that you get six metre waves. And that's why you can have flooding you know, of, of, of that extent. So, uh, next slide please. So, wh what does the future look like uh, for us? The, the, the first thing that we need to bear in mind is that Southern Africa warms up as twice the global average. So when we have an agreement in Paris that says, we've got to stop this bus at two degrees Celsius, that means four degrees in South Africa. That means Pretoria in the future has the climate of Uppington in the present. That's what four degrees means. Okay. And that, at this stage, is inescapable. Uh, it's unlikely that the world will stop its temperature rise at two degrees globally. We're actually heading for something like 3.5 degrees. Double that, you get seven degrees in the interior of South Africa. The impacts on rainfall are much more, comp much more difficult to project, but there's now a sort of emerging understanding that the western side of Southern Africa gets dried out. There's a lot of consensus that the bit that's affected by the winter rainfall, in other words, this area, uh, loses rainfall in the shoulder seasons, in other words, in the spring and the autumn. It's not so much that the winter rainfall disappears, or suddenly it appears in summertime, it's those spring and, summer, uh, spring and autumn periods where the rainfall becomes um, uh, uh, unreliable. The picture that you showed up there is um, d g generated by a colleague of mine, he's actually in the next office to mine, who is like, as far as I'm concerned, the best climate modeler in the world. You know, he is just fantastic. We have a, a big ability to do this kind of, uh, uh, of projection at a, at a, at a, at a meaningful uh, scale for us. And what I've shown there is somewhere close to the worst case. But the reason I show that is not to give everyone a big skruk, it's because that's the pathway we're on, okay? That's the so-called business as usual pathway. In other words, if we just khan my on, that's in exactly where we get to. We have a possibility of bending that curve, and we can bend it by about half. In other words, that's the worst case scenario. We can go to a situation which is about half as bad as that. Still serious, okay, but survivable. Next slide. So let's talk about some of the things that matter to us. Agriculture, almost all biology responds to temperature with a curve that looks like that. It's a hump-shaped curve. Things can be too cold, okay? If you're growing millies in Canada and the world warms up by two degrees, it's not such a bad thing, okay? Now you can grow millies much better in Canada. If you're growing millies in the free state and the world warms up by two degrees, it's a really bad thing. We're on the wrong side of the temperature hump. The warmer it gets, the worse it gets. It doesn't get better first and then get worse, okay? And that's just, you know, the straw that we drew. The same applies to warm-blooded animals, such as ourselves and such as livestock, and I will talk a little bit about that uh, in, in a future slide. And so the future for agriculture in South Africa is um, challenged by, by climate change. All right, this is, a, this is, this is an issue. Um, outside of South Africa, the uh, food production in Africa will be impacted about 20% by climate change in the next 50 years. So 20% reduction in food production potential. But to balance that, agriculture in, in Africa can see something like a 300% improvement in efficiency. Okay, just by the application of current known technologies. And so I don't see a future where Africa as a whole all starves because of climate change. Okay, I actually see a future where Africa becomes much more of a food producer than it currently is. But that doesn't necessarily apply to South Africa. In other words, we're likely to become much more vulnerable and much more of a food importer. And that particularly applies to things which have a cold requirement, like grapes or deciduous fruit or livestock. Okay, next slide. We also, of course, are very concerned about water resources. I don't have to tell you about, you know, the, the, the problem of the drought uh, in, in Cape Town. Remember that the drought 
that we experienced in Cape Town only has a small contribution of climate change. The main reason that we ran out of water is because demand has been growing. It's been growing year on year on year at a few percent per year. Climate change has been reducing the supply by fractions of a percent per year, but eventually the one hit the other. And that's why we can say with high future certainty, this will happen again. Okay, the demand keeps going up and the supply is not going up. All right. What made it into a crisis was, in fact, uh, poor policy. Okay, it needn't have been a crisis. If we'd reacted earlier and done things better, and hopefully we've learned about from that, we can avoid it being a recurrent crisis. But just building more storage doesn't help. Storage doesn't make water. In fact, storage wastes water because it evaporates. What we have to learn is to manage that supply-demand story. Okay, and it's much more than just putting in more dams. We don't actually have places to put in efficient dams anymore. We have to think much more creatively than that. Um, but as a, the big picture is that the whole of South Africa ran out of allocatable water in 2014. So you can do the sums for the whole country. This is how much water runs out of the rivers of South Africa, the mean annual run for, runoff of the rivers of South Africa. And that's the amount of water that you have to allocate to different uses. That was full in 2014. So from then once onwards, anyone who gets more water, someone else has to get less water. And unfortunately, the way this calculus works is the people who get less water will always be the farmers. Okay, so currently farmers use two-thirds of the water supply of South Africa. In the future, that simply won't be available. Okay, there are technologies that you can produce the same amount of crops using less water, and that's the route we're going to have to take, okay, because less water will be available for things like farming. When we think about water shortages, we always think about running out of amount of water, but actually what happens is the quality that kills us, you know, and just as a simple example of this, we never run out of water. There's a big thing called the Atlantic Ocean out there. It's full of water, okay. The problem is we can't drink it. All right, so it's always a quality issue, and it's the quality that we, that we need to worry about uh, in, in, in the future. Right, human health impacts. We like to think, you know, we're South Africans. We, we're more tough, okay? We can do this hot thing. You know, we're used to this. It's not like those namby-pamby European folks, you know, <laughs> okay, here's the bad news. We're all mammals, okay? You, your neighbor, Everyone has the same fundamental body temperature, 38.6 degrees, okay? So does your dog and your cat and your budgie. This is a biological constant, okay? And as the air temperature comes towards that, so the ability of warm-blooded animals to cope just goes to hell. All right, they cannot uh, thrive, they cannot produce milk. The first thing that disappears is milk production in dairy crops. Then they cannot put on weight, and then they fail to be able to reproduce, and then they die. Okay, and this is true for you as much as for everyone else. And so don't think that we know how to handle this, okay? We've learned some tricks, like don't go out in the midday sun, all right? But our physiology is exactly the same. And we see large increases in drought in mortality during heat waves in, in, in South Africa. And it's typically amongst the elderly and the very young, people who don't have the, the coping capacity or people who have other, you know, kind of disease uh, things. There's been a lot of talk about, you know, things like malaria moving south into South Africa. It could happen. Malaria is very climate sensitive. I don't think it will because it's all about what you do about it. It's all about what steps you put in place, you know, to keep the mosquitoes out or to treat the malaria, etc. And the same applies to most of the vector-borne diseases. That risk is there, and we've seen some of this amongst livestock diseases as well, okay? But it's not as if there's nothing we can do about it. Water quality, as I've mentioned, is critical because as you raise the temperature, so it's much, much harder to keep the water in a safe condition. And the big killer in drought periods, paradoxically, is diarrhea amongst, uh, amongst young children because they're forced to drink water out of unsuitable uh, situations. I've talked a little bit about heat stress. Every time you raise the temperature by two degrees, you halve the amount of physical work that you can do. By physical work, I mean 
digging holes and you know, plowing fields and, and doing that sort of stuff. So if we're looking at a future which is four degrees warmer, we will only be able to do a quarter of the work, the physical work. So many of our activities will be impossible the way we currently do it. If you're going to do mining in the Northern Cape, um, it's going to be done by miners in air-conditioned uh, you know, uh, front-end loaders uh, and stepping from there into an air-conditioned house and then going in an air-conditioned you know, car uh, back home. There's already places in the world that that's how this is done. Okay, that's the future we're looking at. Next slide. We should remember that we've been blessed with mega biodiversity. We just have an indecent amount of biodiversity in this country. Many of it is sitting out in this mountains over here. And we have a responsibility for that. You can say, look, you know, climate change has happened many times in the past. These organisms, most of them evolved under circumstances of climate change. They can deal with this. Yes, they can, but their ability to deal with it has been cut off by the fact that we've now, for instance, transformed all the valleys between the mountains into other things. So this little, you know, protea which lives on this hill here and it needs to get to that hill over there and a future climate, it can't. It just can't get through. It can't travel fast enough and there's no way through. So there's a whole lot of stuff which we need to do to make sure that this biodiversity survives in the future. And it's not just an ethical responsibility for the rest of creation, that is true. It's also a personal responsibility in the sense that the, what we call the bioeconomy, the fraction of the South African economy which is dependent on biodiversity, um, is a growing fraction, it's around about 25% at the moment, and it's the only part of the economy that's actually still growing. You know, the other parts of the economy are flat or going downwards. The bioeconomy is going up, but we're busy eroding, you know, the basis for that, that, that economy. Okay, next slide. Let's touch on the last depressing topic, which is climate-related disasters. There's a whole spectrum of them. We expect the frequency of big fires to increase. We've got statistics on that. Uh, it's happening all over. It's especially a problem for people who live on the urban fringe. Okay, that's where you get the, 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 the big problems. Flooding and landslide risk, uh, especially along the coastal areas, but also in the interior, often huge impact on the poor, because the way the urban poor settle in South Africa is typically in valley bottoms. That's the land, you know, which has been kept uh, of, uh, open because it's within the flood line. That's where the people settle, okay, and so they're incredibly uh, vulnerable there. Severe storms, I grew up in Johannesburg, I've spent most of my life there. We never used to get tornadoes, never, it just didn't happen. Yeah, yeah, little dust devils, yeah, 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 but the tornado that takes out a whole shopping center, we never saw that. We've had like four in the last, you know, 10 years. So we're suddenly seeing these high wind events uh, coming. And then of course, drought, um, we've always lived with drought, but the intensity and the frequency and the duration is going up. Next slide. All right, so let's now get on to the uplifting part of it. What can we do about this? Firstly, what can the church do about this? The first is that you are the guys who have responsibility for moral authority. I, my perception of climate change is that it is fundamentally not a scientific, technical issue. It's an ethical issue, okay? And you are the guys who have put up your hands to say, we know about ethics. We know about the way people should behave, okay? And so you can use that moral authority to help to communicate um, the, the, the circumstances and to create this uh, sense of responsibility for, for sh stewardship of the planet. The next slide is that you have enormous convening power. Look at this community here, you know, 700 people. Each of you has access to another 400 people. You know, what an incredible multiplier, a communication multiplier you, you, you have at your disposal. Then the next point is that you need, if you're going to set that tone of moral authority and get people to take action, you can't credibly do that unless you're walking the talk. Okay, unless you're actually doing it yourself. And so, for, th for that reason, the churches themselves have to behave in a way, okay, which is consistent with trying to avoid these problems of, of, of climate change. Now, that in itself is going to make a tiny difference. You know, changing your church's light bulbs from incandescent to LED is not going to save the world. But the point is, you can't message this unless you doing that internally yourself. 
Okay. And then finally, and perhaps most importantly, that last video we had about we can no longer avoid climate change. We are facing already, a, we're committed to a very uncomfortable amount of climate change, particularly in Southern Africa. There are victims. We have to help them to adapt, and we have to care for those who have, or aren't able to adapt. And we don't have to look in some distant country, you know, in the Sahel. That's all good. That's good. I'm not against that at all. But in fact, it's very close to home. It's, it's the farming communities that you serve. Uh, it's uh, the fire victims, you know, in Cape Town or in Neisner. Uh, it, you know, it, this, this is not something which is going to be happening in faraway places. It's happening in our own backyard, in our own communities. And uh, we also have, as, a, as, a, as, as the technologically kind of advanced uh, country in Southern Africa, a responsibility to neighbors. So when there is a thing like Cyclone Edai, uh, we do have a responsibility to bring regional assistance to, to that kind of problem. Right. Next slide, please. The critical thing is what can you, as individuals, not necessarily as dominies or as elders or as you know, CEOs of companies, you can do things in all of those spheres, but you actually, we, all of us, individually, have to do stuff for this collective problem to be solved. So the challenge that I set myself, I'm a big, big sinner in this. I fly all around the world talking about climate change. My personal carbon footprint is, you know, huge. Uh, how do I live with that? So my personal approach is I try to set myself the same target as I expect the South African government to meet. And the South African government has made a set of international commitments, which is not that we're going to suddenly reduce our emissions. We are going to plateau them, uh, take them level, and then drop them. And that, 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 that kind of reduction is about 40%. So I must achieve in my personal life what I expect the government to achieve collectively, which is something like a 40% reduction. And, the, and the, 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 the short answer is achieving a 40% reduction is actually not difficult at all. Okay, you can do that. You don't have to go to zero. You don't all have to become sandal-wearing, living in a tent, you know, um, walking everywhere, you know, uh, 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 newly converted. You just have to be thoughtful about what you do. And the first thing is, of course, is to create awareness and share that awareness. So when you hear someone going off about, ah, oh, no, this climate change stuff is a lot of rubbish, you know, take them on. I say, really? You know, what about these facts? Don't you care about your kids? You know, this, so, so start creating that awareness. And then you need to do, you know, in your personal sphere, a whole bunch of things that will allow your impact to be substantially uh, reduced. And then finally, reduction of the change is not going to be enough. We have to reduce the amount of climate change, but we also have to adapt to it. And there's a whole bunch of things which we can do in our personal lives to adapt to the change which is now inevitable. Things like in our gardens, we must just be smarter about what we plant and how we water it and how we use water. Uh, we need to make sure that when we build houses, that we build them to a new climate specification, not to the climate that our you know, parents experienced. Uh, it's amazing to me that we build RDP housing without insulation. What are we thinking? You know, it only adds a few hundred rand to the cost of the thing. Um, we can make people's lives so much better by just doing simple things like that, changing our building clothes. And then be very aware of the real risks that we face, psychological risks and physical risks from climate disasters. I've shown a little image there of the, the house that I built for myself. Um, and I felt guilty about my carbon footprint, so I said, I'm going to build a house which has as small a footprint in all respects as possible. And I couldn't get anyone to do it, because they wouldn't, they just laughed, and so I had to do it myself. And th the house that I built, I, I think you'll agree, it doesn't look like a tent, okay? It looks like a house, it behaves like a house, it's actually very nice. It has a carbon footprint which is about a quarter of a conventional house. What most people don't know is that the carbon impact of building is almost all invoked in the building process. Okay, it would take you the whole of your life of changing the light bulbs. Okay, to make to to make up 
that carbon debt you've in incurred in, in, in the construction uh, process. So, you know, that house is completely off the grid. I smile, okay, when Eskom goes down because I'm not on Eskom. <laughs> it's built out of low emission materials. Um, it's highly insulated. It can be done. At a stroke, I reduced my carbon footprint with respect to my housing by 75%, and I didn't suffer a moment. Okay, and there's a lot of things we can do where, where we can make a big difference without having to give up a whole bunch of stuff. Okay, next slide. So, the key things you can do to actually address your climate impact, I would start with, the first thing is use your consumer choices. The companies of the world don't destroy the global ecology or climate because they want to, okay? They're not setting out, like, what, how, what should we destroy today? They, they're responding to market demands, and we create those market demands. And when you send the market signals, no, I don't want that, I want this one. You can go and buy a fridge which has an, a triple A rating. Yes, it costs you a thousand rand more than buying the one with the, the D rating, but in the long term, in fact, it performs better. Okay, and so it, it's, n it's not a sacrifice, it just helps the, 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 the planet. You can do the same thing with your car. You know, yes, you can buy a car uh, which is, you know, comfortable and strong and gets through from A to B, uh, but which has half the consumption of the other one. So just put that in your list of things that when you go and buy your car, I not only want to know what color it comes in and does it have leather seats, by the way, what's the CO2 emission? Okay. Um, the issue of trying to source our food closer to home instead of flying it in from Kenya or from the other side of the world. Yeah, special items, we're not talking about that. We're talking about our everyday food consumption. Let's try to localize that more. Importantly, there's this whole thing about the lifespan of stuff, okay? The reduce, reuse, recycle kind of trilogy. I'm a huge fan of the, 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 the English um, poet and cleric, Gerald Manley Hopkins, and he's got this wonderful line which reads, the world is too much with us late and soon, getting and spending, we lay waste our powers. Okay, this whole drive always to have more stuff. Okay, we're drowning in stuff. It's killing us spiritually, it's also killing the planet. Okay, we need to have less stuff. Okay, so that's the first thing, reduce. Do you really need that extra thing? The second thing is that, as I've already pointed out, much of the impact of things is in their manufacture. So if you can extend the lifespan of things, you automatically make them more efficient. So don't replace your car after three years, make it last 10 years. You know, don't knock down your house after 20 years and build a new one. Modify it, okay, or repurpose it or, or whatever. That's the sort of reuse cycle. And then finally, when things do get to the end of their lives, we recycle them. And that saves hugely in their energy and material demands. Travel is a huge issue for me, okay, and so the, the approach that I take is just consciously think about reducing unnecessary travel. So when I travel, and I, I think that my travel is necessary, obviously I do, okay, I try to double up on things. I didn't come down here to Cape Town to speak to you, okay? I came down to Cape Town for two other meetings, and I could tack this one on, so I can make that trip do three jobs. Just start thinking about that. Big meetings, we can these days hold them virtually in many instances, not all of them, but some of them. We can save a huge amount there. And even, you know, do things like share transport. My wife, my son, and myself all go to university in the same car together. It takes a bit of a fight in the morning about when shall we go and, you know, blah, blah, blah. But, you know, it kind of works. And then we just need to be energy efficient and thoughtful uh, uh, about our, our use of energy. It's already cost effective to be generating your own electricity by solar voltaics. It is certainly very cost effective to have solar hot water you know, on your house, uh, things like that. So just think about these issues. Again, you can do this without huge sacrifice and you can make collectively a big difference. Next slide, please. And those are some of the sums for me, okay, that I can achieve. By choosing the right products, I can reduce my footprint by about 
by recycling, I can reduce it by about 30%. By reducing my travel, I can cut it down by about 40%. By being energy efficient, I can reduce it by about 50%. You add that up, I'm meeting the target I've set myself, which is just do what I expect the government to do, which is to drop the collective emissions down by about 40% over the next decade. And it's not that hard. I didn't have to suffer in the process. In fact, I get certain gloating points when I drive home and the whole neighborhood is in darkness except for the Skulls household, which has got bright lights. <laughs> All right, you know, what's that, that, that advert that you see on, the, on, 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 on television, you know, price of a cup of coffee, you know, three euros, 50, you know, enjoying the view, priceless. <laughs> okay, next slide, please. So that's the, uh, the, you know, the, the, the end of my story. I'd be very, very happy to have an interactive exchange of, of views and questions, both in this session, and I'll be here until about 3 o'clock uh, th this afternoon, if you just go to the next slide. Um, my wife and I wrote this book a few years ago. It's now, I think, out of print, but you can get it as a free PDF. And what it does is it takes these climate change questions and translates them for ordinary people's use especially in South Africa. So it can, climate change can be very complicated and can seem very distant. What it does is do what I've done in this session, present the science, talk about the impacts, talk about the actions you can do, all in a very South African context. And so I would encourage you to go and look for a copy of that. Thank you. Um, there were a few questions posed to uh, Professor Scholes and I would like to give him the opportunity to respond to that. Thank you, uh, Professor. Am, am I broadcasting? Yes, I am. Okay, it's just taking them in, in the order in which they came in. There was a question about fracking in the Karoo uh, and what should the church do about it. Actually, I don't think you have to do anything about it at the moment. I think it's very, very unlikely to occur. And the reason is geological. Uh, yeah, God, in his wisdom, uh, filled the Karoo with dolerite dikes, okay? And that did two things. It cooked out the gases that were there, and it made the stuff that remained behind very hard to get at. So I think it's highly unlikely that there will ever be fracking uh, in, in the Karoo. <laughs> if there were fracking in the Karoo, it wouldn't help us a great deal with our climate change challenge. And the reason for that is, although if you substitute coal with gas, you reduce your, your footprint by about 50%. Oh, that's fantastic. Let's just all use gas. But that depends on there being no gas leaks. The moment there's a leak, even a 2% leak wipes out that benefit completely because methane is a much more powerful greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. On nuclear, nuclear is a low carbon uh, technology. So in principle, it could be part of the mix of future solutions that we have. My, my objection to nuclear is not environmental, it's economic. Um, it, it, nuclear, even under the most optimistic projections, currently costs four times more than renewable. So why would you do it? Um, question about population growth. So it's, it's obvious that the more people we have, the bigger impact we have on the earth. Okay, that's, that's a given. But just, I put two little uh, interpretations on that. The first is that you may well have learned when you were in school that the population of the world is growing exponentially. That is not true, and it hasn't been true for about two decades. The world is actually entering the flat part of an S-shaped growth curve. Most of the world is already there. South Africa is already there, actually. The, in, the population growth rate in South Africa is very close to zero with the exception of, of, of in-migration, okay? And that happened around the world through a process called demographic transition, which is kind of almost a rule of nature. You, you know, the, 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 this happens, it's unavoidable. And the main thing, if you want to speed it up, is not to hand out condoms or to tell people they mustn't have sex, it's to educate girls. If you want to reduce the population growth rate, you improve the education of young women works like an absolute charm. The next thing is that, in fact, we have a scientific method of allocating the size of different effects. If you see a phenomenon, you can, you can assign responsibilities to that outcome. 
and we can assign responsibilities to the sort of impacts that humans are having on the world, about 25% of our impact is due to numbers, population, and 75% is due to consumption per capita. Okay, so in this big equation here, yes, population matters, it doesn't matter nearly as much as consumption growth. And so we can't make a point of our population control if we're not making simultaneously efforts on the consumption side. Okay, and that's you know a, 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 a really important point. Um, I've asked a, a, a question here: What should the government and the private sector be doing? So, the government fundamental responsibility is to govern, and especially to set up standards and regulation. Other sectors can't do that, so we expect the government to do that, and we need to be. We need to be active participation, participants in that, you know, in, in, in debating those, but we also need to be obedient to the, um, to the norms and standards that we collectively uh, d decide on. And the South African government legislation around climate change and approach around climate change is actually quite good. Um, at, a, at a theoretical level, at a policy level, it's really good. The problem in this domain, as in many other domains in South Africa, is there's a huge gap between what we say we're going to do and what we actually do. Okay, so this is what we say we're going to do in the environmental area. This department didn't get the memo and is building coal-fired power stations as fast as it can. Okay, so there's a divergence between you know in intention and, and 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 action. The private sector is kind of already got this story. Uh, I three times a year lecture to top CEOs of big global corporations and big South African corporations. They're no longer arguing it doesn't, it doesn't occur, climate change, and it's not my job. They're, they're on board. And the, one of the leaders in this is the financial sector, and especially the long-term investment sector. So old mutual, Sunlum, those O's. They have to invest in a 30-year time frame because that's what pension funds are. And so it's hugely in their interest to invest in a way that um, the future is de-risked, okay? And so they are big movers and shakers in the climate change adaptation. And they're just simply saying, big banks in South Africa said, we're not gonna fund any more coal-fired power stations. You can plan to build them, but I'm not gonna pay for them, okay? Uh, so there's you know, all kinds of movements taking place in the private sector. One of the good ones that I welcome is that you can now put your pension fund into a so-called ESG fund, a fund which takes into account the impact on the world. And here's the good news. To date, the ESG funds have significantly outperformed general market standards. So you can put your pension you know, into one of those funds which is doing good for the planet instead of bad for the planet, and by the way, you'll get a good you know, return on investment. Um, I was asked a, a really interesting question um, about um, uh, what, what are the, you know, the biggest drivers of the emissions leading to climate change. There are about 80% fossil fuel combustion and 20% things that we do on the land. Uh, deforestation, uh, plowing new fields, those sorts of changes, you know, uh, and, and, and things we do in agriculture. Uh, animals, um, fertilizers, those sorts of things. So that's about the split. Remembering that the the 80% which is from fossil fuels uh, isn't all ESKIM, okay? It's about a quarter of that is, is transport, so cars, trains, planes, etc. Uh, and then th the rest of it is, is energy consumption. But ESKIM doesn't pollute the atmosphere because it wants to. It pollutes the atmosphere to provide us a service which we use. So ultimately, that energy is your emission. It's not ESKIM's emission, okay, collectively. Um, there was an interesting question about what can we do about large sporting events to reduce their carbon footprint. I'd never really thought deeply about it, but the first thing I would look into is uh, think about waste production. Those kind of events typically generate huge amounts of waste, quite unintentionally, it's just they don't apply their man to the problem. And you can reduce that waste stream probably by 30 or 40 percent. And waste translates directly into energy costs. Not only the, the, the methane that's generated from the, from the disposal of the waste, but also if you can reduce the waste, you can reduce the upstream production. 
you know, so just sort of think a bit laterally about this. Obviously, you know, nighttime events with those huge floodlights, that's an, that's an energy drain. You might think of how to source that energy um, in ways which are, which are renewable, etc. Uh, and then think about the, uh, the, how do people get to events. So if you can make it simpler for them to use park and ride or to share transport, all of this, you know, helps. The good news is that when you go to the rugby, you don't have to worry about not holding a bryflace. Okay, a bryflace is carbon neutral. In South Africa, a bryflace is carbon neutral. Okay. <laughs> just, ju just source your charcoal sustainably. Okay. All right. Uh, and then the, 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 the final uh, point here is how much of the South African energy mix can be supplied from renewables. So we know that about 26% right now can be supplied by renewables without gr grid instability. Um, interestingly, if we add gas into that mix, now that gas doesn't have to come from fracking, it can come from offshore fines like the Brill Plata find, or it can come from imported gas. The moment you add gas into the mix, you can paradoxically increase the amount of renewables. Because the problem with renewables is when the sun goes down, you need to fill in the holes. And, and so you need something to pick that up. And so by adding something which is quick to fire up and efficient like gas, you can increase that renewable fraction maybe up to 50%. And within the next decade or so, it will be possible to push the South African energy uh, mix up to in the region of 100% from renewables. And that's because of the big, big breakthroughs taking place in storage technologies. And that this is things like batteries, lithium batteries. Elon Musk sold to the Victorian government in Australia uh, a, a, a zillion kilowatt hour battery, you know, because they have the same problem. So these things are now, now possible. But we also have some interesting things going on in South Africa. We have this technology called concentrated solar power, which is where you use the sun's heat to melt a big block of, uh, of salt, okay? And that molten salt holds enough energy to power you know, your electricity right the way through the night. So there are other ways that we can uh, store electricity as well. So that was the question so far. Uh, friends, um, uh, I think it's uh, appropriate to thank uh, um, Professor Skulls from the bottoms of our hearts because um, he brought to us the serious news of a lot of work that we have to, to do in our own interest. Professor Skulls, thank you so much. Uh, we don't really know how to thank you, but I'm going to start by presenting you uh, uh, three bottles of wine from That's the valley, a good start. but I still is it the good start? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm not sure how, how organic it was <laughs> when it was produced, but it's yours. <laughs> you may you may take that with you. No. I, I don't I don't think I need to tell you that uh, Professor Scholes is 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 a, is a national asset. Um, participating in the global conversation. Um, participating in the global conversation is so, so important because we are not on an island. We're part of a gl global system, an uh, ecosystem, where we are participants in a huge um, cycle of, um, of energy. And uh, there are people who have to take responsibility to, to look globally to this whole issue, and he's one of them. Prepared for that in a, in a way that only the Lord can do. And uh, Professor Scholes, we want to wish you the best. We want you to look after yourself. We need you. We need people like you to guide us over the next uh, decades. Thank you so much. And may the Lord bless you and your family. And... Uh, I hope that we can uh, draw for, from your expertise in, in future. And I, I would like to put his uh, email address again on the screen right now because there were people inquiring about that. Professor Scholes, thank you so, so very much. Um,